Greetings everyone, Rob Chastner here, and we are beginning a new study series um, called uh, Connecting the Dots of Scripture. So what we're going to be doing is looking at uh, relating Old Testament verses to New Testament verses. Um, there's another great study just uh, on the, the Old Testament verses in the book of Revelation. Uh, when you look at um, my YouTube channel study of the book of Revelation, you'll find that there are 404 verses in Revelation, of which 278 of those verses are Old Testament matching verses. Here what we're going to do is take prophecy and themes that are in the Old Testament and uh, and show how they relate with one another in the Old Testament as well as how they're fulfilled and show up in the New Testament. So I find it a fascinating study. You're going to need your Bibles on this because we're going to flip from one book to another and go back and forth. So uh, when you take this study, please have your Bibles or your iPads handy to re uh, read those verses. All right, um, we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, with the very first prophetic uh, statement of scripture. Adam and Eve have just eaten from the tree. Uh, they've fallen and the curse has immediately begun. Uh, they will be out of the garden and starting a whole new concept of life, and it's going to be under the curse, and it's going to be a whole new relationship with God, not in complete innocence, but through the process of sins being forgiven. So uh, turn to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, and here you have Satan just approaching them uh, in the garden. You remember the instruction from God was, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat and the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden but they partook in the tree of the knowledge of knowledge of good e good and evil so let's take a look verse uh, genesis 3 6 which says and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree of the desire sorry and a tree to be desired to make one wise she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Notice um, she's not called Eve here. Notice she is referred to as the woman, and uh, that will happen sometime later on. So they've both eaten. Now verse 7, because of the act of disobedience, um, Remember, the fruit is not the problem. It was their act of disobedience. So that was the sin. That's what caused the fall. So verse 7, And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, God did not tell them to, to, to sew fig leaves. Uh, they did that on their own volition. So uh, we're told in uh, Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, it says, There is a way which seems right by uh, unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So this is a perfect example with their fig leaves. They thought it would be sufficient that, would cover, uh, uh, that it would cover their nakedness and God would never know the difference. But it wasn't. Uh, it was a way of, uh, uh, of spiritual death. Um, and so let's take a look now at Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in a cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now just think for a minute. What did they do? They ran from God and they hid. Now, let's just compare scripture with scripture. Keep your hand right there in Genesis 3 and turn over to John's gospel, chapter 3, verse 18. John 3, verse 18. Now, as I refer to these, if you need to press pause to get to that and then press play again, that's perfectly fine. Uh, this is the Lord speaking in his earthly ministry. 
uh, John chapter 3, verse 18 and 19, he that believes on him, of course, that's referring to God the Son, um, is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Now watch verse 20. This is Adam and Eve all over again. All right, so this is John chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that does truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. In other words, God, sorry, in other words, uh, Adam and Eve started the whole ball rolling that men in their sinful condition do not run to God as God would have them, but what do they do? They go in the opposite direction. They go and they hide. Uh, they, they live a life of uh, denial. All right, uh, turn back to Genesis chapter 3 where this all started, um, and uh, of course the, the name, the word Genesis means beginning or in the beginning, and that's what this is, a book of the beginnings. Genesis 3 verses 8 and 9, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden, and the Lord called unto, uh, Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Now, it's interesting, do you think that uh, an omnipotent and an omniscient, uh, omnipresent God did not know where these two people were? Well, of course they knew. Uh, but but um, have you ever realized that all throughout his earthly ministry, Whenever Jesus was confronted by someone, whether it was the Pharisees or the Sadducees or, or whomever, how did he invariably answer? He answered with a question. He always does. Over and over, he would open a conversation with, uh, uh, with a question. Now, that word asking is an interesting word. If you break it down, it's two words, as and king, as and king. So when you're asking a question, you're acting as a king. But when you answer, you depose yourself. Well, in the same way, he wasn't asking the question because he didn't know where they were. He was asking the question to essentially put them on a soapbox <laughs> or, or a witness box here. And he asked the question, where are you? And what do you suppose they said? All right, Genesis 3, verse 10 uh, and 11. And then he, that'd be Adam, said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And then the Lord said, who told you that you were naked? Now here comes the question, God knew. But, uh, uh, but the point is to bring Adam up to a place that he had to respond. And then he says, God says to Adam, have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you not to, that you should not eat? Now, look at Adam's answer. The human race is already showing all of its frailties here, just as Soon as he's confronted with guilt, what's the number one thing he does? He looks for a scapegoat. Um, he says, she did it. I didn't do it. She did it. It's all her fault. And that's exactly where it was. Uh, but that's human nature. We might as well face it. And it started with Adam. All right, Genesis 3, verses 12 and 13. And the man said, the woman who, whom thou gave to me, sorry, the woman that, uh, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the, uh, unto the woman, that would be Eve, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I ate. So she's finding a scapegoat also. Now, here we come to where we want to begin uh, this, this connecting the dots uh, in the, between the Old and the New Testament over the study series. Now, here we are approaching the very first prophecy in Scripture where God is foretelling something that's going to take place 
a couple thousand years in the future. And what is it? It's the promise of a coming Redeemer. All right, Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And the Lord said, the Lord God said unto the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle and above every beast in the field. Upon thy belly shall you go and dust shall you eat, uh, eat all the days of your life. And I will put en enmity between you and the woman and between the seed, thy, your seed and her seed. Now, <clears throat> in other words, all the demonic forces of Satan, when he says, and her seed, whose seed is he speaking of? Well, that would be Eve. Uh, uh, most people miss that. <clears throat> We're talking about the Messiah here. He's going to come as a result of the promise, uh, promises made here to Adam and Eve. Now, if you don't understand this, let's get some scripture to help you understand. So keep your finger there and let's turn over to Galatians chapter 3 and look at verse 16. And it says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Well, uh, we'll be looking at that. Um, he did not say, and to seeds, he didn't say plural. Uh, um, in other words, not many of us, but as one, and, and to thy seed, which of course is Jesus Christ. Now, we said back there uh, it was the seed of the woman. In Galatians 4, chapter 4, the Apostle Paul refers to this one time to Bethlehem, uh, of course, Bethlehem is a compound Hebrew word, bet or beth means house and lechem means bread. So the town of Bethlehem has the meaning of the city of bread or the house of bread. Uh, never a reference to, to, to his birth. Uh, that's what Christianity pulls, uh, puts all their emphasis on. Um, you know, uh, Christmas and the celebration of all that, but Paul does. And all, uh, now, here's here's one of the reasons. Look at look at Galatians four four the beginning. But when the fullness of the time has was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Now, what does that mean? The fullness of time. That at the exact day, the exact hour, the exact minute. God has prescribed from eternity past, Jesus Christ is born, not a day late, not a day early, but right on his schedule. That's what the fullness of time is. And what was his son made of? A woman. What do we say the in incarnate means? God in human form. The God man in the flesh, and that's exactly what it was when God sent forth the son, Jesus Christ, by means of a woman so that he would now be God-man. It says, God sent forth his son, made of woman, made under the law. It went all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, uh, which let's turn back now to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Now, this is, a prof this is prophecy. This is God telling us uh, that um, what's going to take place over the next 6,000 years, and it's accurate to the very last detail. So let's look at Genesis 3.15 again. It says, and I will put enmity, or a running battle, between thee, that would be Satan, and the woman. Interesting that the nation of Israel is referred to in the female gender. And it is through Israel that Satan is always trying to defeat God because Satan knows that he can destroy the nation of it, if he can destroy the nation of Israel, and he would, he would win over God because in all of God's prophecies, not just is, uh, not in the, just in the first advent, but all the way up to the second advent, Israel is a key player. Never forget that. If Satan can destroy Israel, that's why Satan is using, uh, the leadership of Iran. Uh, Satan would love nothing more than for Iran to beat Israel and wipe them off the map. If Israel, is gone and God's program falls apart and Satan wins. So we know it's not going to happen. It's merely a threat and it will never happen because God will never allow it to happen. But it is a running battle. 
All right, Genesis 3, verse 15, the second part, and between this, thy, thy seed, uh, that would be the demonic and the wicked host of Satan, and her seed, that would be the woman, uh, which is which is Christ, it shall be, it shall bruise your thy head. In other words, that's the only place you can defeat a serpent on the head. Jesus did that on the cross. There, that, that's where Satan became a defeated foe. And it says, and thou, that means Satan, shall bruise his heel. Now that would be the seed of the woman, which of course was the suffering and all that accompanied uh, when Jesus went on to the cross. So now we have the beginning of the human experience. Adam and Eve will now be cast out of the garden. They're going to have to live under the, the curse. They're going to have to battle the sweat on their face. They're going to have to battle insects and drought and death and everything else that's associated with the curse. <coughs> and we're still experiencing that today, of course. But those of us who know the Bible know that the day is coming. It's not going to be much longer because one of these days Christ is going to show up. Uh, he is still superior to Satan. He's going to come and complete his prophetic program. So here we have his first true prophecy in the Bible in Genesis chapter 3. Now for the next 11 chapters, there's really not much going on other than sad commentary about the human race. Uh, not much good stuff going on except a record of going down and down and down. A uh, human race is leading up to the next great event, which of course is the flood. Now, <clears throat> our timeline starts with Abraham, then the flood 1600 years in round figures after the creation of Adam. Now stop and think, 1600 years is a long time. Um, so from Adam until the flood, six, uh, 1600 years, there's almost, they, they are mostly living to be 800 or 900 years old. So God knows how many children uh, every couple had. So you had a tremendous population explosion. And by the time of Noah's flood, historians say that, they, that there were approximately 4 billion people on the then known world, maybe more. But out of the 4 billion people, let's just look quickly at their behavior in Genesis chapter six. And so we get a full understanding of why God is so severe in his judgment of that generation. So that would be Genesis chapter six and verse five. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. So his heart, that was a reference to man's heart. Now remember, when studying Theophanies, God is invisible until Christ appears in Bethlehem. And uh, it's the invisible triune God that would appear from time to time in the temporary human form. But God, for the most part, all through the Old Testament was the invisible realm of the Holy Trinity, uh, God the Son and God the Father um, and, the Holy, and the Holy Spirit. So um, anytime you see a theophany occur, it's going to be Jesus, uh, a reference to Jesus, the Lord. All right. So whenever you see the word God back here in Genesis, especially uh, Elohim, that would be the triune God. And what uh, what does verse five mean? Those people who uh, those people could not think a decent thought even once in a 24 hour period. It was just nothing but a mindset of continual wickedness. Um, and uh, our world is getting that way today, obviously. All right, Genesis chapter six, verses six and seven. And it repented the Lord. In other words, God was sorry uh, that he had made man on the earth and grieved him at this heart. So he's got to do something. He just can't let it go until everybody kills everybody else. Verse seven, and the Lord said, I will destroy man whom... I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air for it repented, it repented me or it makes me sorry. In other words, made God sorry that I have made them. But then we know Genesis chapter six, verse eight, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But let's keep our focus on the moment for the moment on this picture 
of, uh, of wickedness. Go down to Genesis 6, verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. The earth, now, uh, we know that the earth wasn't like it is today because the flood completely changed the makeup of the planet's surface, but land mass was there, and before the flood, it does not make any sense. Uh, I think it's pretty much totally occupied by human beings. It says the whole earth, or the earth, was was corrupt, or in other words, the whole earth. Now, don't read that word casually. The whole thing was just like the old seed potato that got rotten to the core. What do you do with an old rotten potato? You have to destroy it. You have to get rid of it. And so uh, we think of Baghdad. Uh, we think Baghdad has, has been bad, uh, and it has, but you know, uh, that was just a sampling of the whole planet just before the flood. They were killing one another over and over. Uh, they had violence everywhere, and uh, it was a society of nothing but murder and mayhem. All right, Genesis chapter 6, verse 12 and 13, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh, not just some of it, but all of it, had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of, of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, of course, that brought in the phenomena of, of Noah's flood. You can look at Peter, Second uh, Peter chapter 3. Um, uh, be aware that you will never see the secular world in science or anything else, uh, they will never admit to the, the flood of Noah. But let's look at um, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, and always remember that the mentality of the secular world is, is, is this very uh, same to the, today, and it, it, that they totally reject uh, spiritual the spiritual account of the Noah's flood. All right, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 4, 5, and 6, and, and saying, okay, they were saying, uh, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, and uh, that by the word of God the heavens were uh, of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, uh, whereby the world that then was being overflowed by water perished. And what does Peter say? They are willingly ignorant. Uh, they do not believe the account of, uh, of Noah's flood. All right. Um, we're continuing now. Uh, just changing my notes here. Okay. So after the flood, the population starts expanding once again. God has instructed Noah and his three sons and their families to to do what? To replenish or to fill up the earth. I'm having a little technical difficulty here. There we go. Um, and so that meant that they were to scatter, uh, not to stay in one place, but man is always rebellious, and man does not do what God wants him to do. So let's turn now to verse, sorry, Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. And what does it say? The whole earth was of one language, and of one speech, and it came to pass that they journeyed from the east, and they found a plain of the land in Shinar, and they dwelt there, and they said to one another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime for mortar, mortar and they, that's the population in general, said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, 
and let us make us a name lest we be scattered. All right, so interesting. Uh, God tells them to scatter, and here they're doing something so they're not scattered. It, uh, it's going to be a place of worship. Uh, now, they did not think they could build a tower leading all the way up to heaven, but um, it's a place of worship where they could make contact with what they conceived of as God. Now, where it says in this verse for uh, 4b, and let us make a name lest we be scattered. Can you see the rebellion? In casually reading this, you'll miss it. But God says scatter and replenish. And man says, now we're going to stay here lest we be scattered. All right, verse uh, 5 and 6 in Genesis 11. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower and the children of men builded. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one and they have all one language and this they began to do and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do now again you don't want to read this casually on what basis could god say something like this um whatever they imagined they could do well uh they're not far from um the pre-flood civilization, only a, a couple hundred years. Um, and during that pre-flood, they had a lot of technology. Um, you know, they had super, super brain power. Uh, they were living, um, there was nothing deteriorating. They were living 900 years. And so evidence shows in the ancient past, evidence of computers and internal combustion engines and maps like you cannot believe and we have to say i you know i uh, yeah i believe that history shows that before the flood they had tremendous technology uh so uh, this makes sense uh they're only 200 years removed so enough of the technology would have been available and god said it there's nothing to restrain them from what they can't do unless he does something drastic which was to confuse the languages. Now stop and think, what is the what is one of the major reasons why we have such an explosive uh, uh, advancement in technology over the last hundred years? Well, science is all done in one language throughout the world, and that's English. And so uh, in Japan and Europe and America, everything they use they use English. And so we're back full circle here. Uh, um, the advantage of one language, uh, there's almost nothing that they could, uh, they, that they would not be able to invent or create or do. And so the Lord said, there is nothing that they cannot do. So he had to interrupt it, it by confusion of the language. Now, remember time wise, we've got the flood 1600 years after Adam. And then 200 years after Noah, we have the tower of Bab Babel. Now we're going to skip to the, uh, the next 200 years and skip uh, down to Genesis chapter 11 and verse 31, where uh, here we're at about 2,000 years after Adam and about 2,000 years before Christ. Abraham stands at the midpoint of creation and Christ's first coming. So Genesis 11 verses 31 and 32 and Terah, that was the father of Abraham, took Abram and uh, Abram, his son, and Lot, his son of the son of Haran, uh, his son's son, and Sarah, sorry, uh, the daughter-in-law, and uh, his son Abraham, Abram's wife. Um, and they went forth uh, with them from Ur of the Chal Chaldees. Now the Chaldees, remember, they were the people of Babylon, um, to go into the land of Canaan, which was down the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And they came unto Haran, which was is now the modern day uh, Syria and Lebanon. And they dwelt there. Now that's where God stopped them. And uh, the days of Terah, were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. Now, before we go further, let's take a look at the book of Joshua, 
uh, the very last chapter, because there we see the kind of family this was before God intervened. You know, remember that the Tower of Babel began 200 years before. This meant that the whole then known population came under the influence of Nimrod, who was the instigator of paganism, and other names of Nimrod were likely Zeus and Orisus uh, and some of those other pagan names. They all referred to Nimrod. He was the beginning of all the pagan religions and idolatry. So this little family that we're dealing with was no different. Remember the setting. <coughs> this is Israel after having gone into the promised land. Joshua has helped them occupy it, fought all the battles. Remember uh, the Battle of Jericho? And uh, it's time for Joshua to move on and, and die and join the, the forefathers. But look what he says. We're in Joshua chapter 24, verse 2. Joshua, and Joshua said unto all the people, Thus says the Lord of God of it, the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, that would be your forefathers, dwelt on the other side of the river in old time. That's the Euphrates River. And Terah, the father of Abraham, the father of Nahor, uh, and they, that'd be the whole family, served other gods. That's plural. So what were they? They were the, the entire family. They were idolaters. They were pagan idolaters, even uh, every one of them. Uh, now, you think about modern day over in the Orient, uh, who is the head of the family? Well, that would be the patriarch, the father. And in this case, with Abram's family, it was Terah. Now, uh, do you think that Abraham would have accepted the call of God and separated from uh, uh, the uh, patriarch, uh, Terah? Um, he wouldn't have done so because of the power of the patriarch. He never would have left his family. So God works in his own time. He does his own miracles in his own time. And he just waited until Terah died. And so we come to chapter 12 of Genesis. Terah is gone. Um, he's dead. And, and they're still living up there in Haran. They're out of Ur. But... They are in Haran, which is between Ur and Canaan. So Genesis chapter 1 and verse, uh, sorry, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord said unto Abram, back there in chapter 11, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land which I will show you. Now why is God laying down these stipulations? He wants to separate Abram from idolatry. He wants to separate Abram from paganism. He doesn't say, take the family with you, but rather separate from the family. Well, what does Paul tell us in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 6, verse 17? Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. What does Revelation say? Come out from among them. Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins and contract any uh, of um, her plagues. Why? Because a believer cannot consort with an unbelieving world day in and day out and and uh, have any spiritual growth. It's impossible. Now, we're in the real world. We know that, but you still cannot mingle with unbelievers and have spiritual growth. So the concept here is uh, always the same. Separate. Be sanctified. Separate. Set yourself apart from the gross unbelieving world. And so to keep it in context, Genesis 12, verses 1 and 2. Now the Lord said to Abram, get thee out of the country from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land I will show you. Now here comes the promise of the prophecy. And I, this is verse 2 of chapter 12, I will make you a great nation. Now we think of Israel today as nothing more than a little nothing uh, 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 country in the uh, 
in the affairs of the world. But you've got to remember that, um, you know, back in these old days, people were still tribal. They were, they, there were no real nationalities. And so the nation of Israel is going to become one of the greatest tribes, if you will, of that part of the world before anything started exploding around, uh, started exploding around them. So they are going to become a great nation in the eyes of antiquity, even though in today's world they were pretty small. All right, Genesis chapter 12, verses 2b and 3. And I will bless you and make you make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those that bless you. Now, this is the promise that holds today, some 2,000 years, you know, just as much as it did 2,000 years before Christ. I will bless you that bless, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Now, here comes the prophecy, and in thee, as Abraham, shall all families of earth of the earth be blessed. Well, how can you and I, living in the 21st century on the other side of the world, be blessed by the blessings given to Abraham? Uh, and that would be through the cross, uh, the work of the cross through the Bible. Now, every word in the Bible. Um, it, in, it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's written. Uh, it's it's written by many different scribes, but it's all inspired by by God. You look at Romans chapter three, verses one and two. It says, "What advantage then has a Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly <coughs> because that unto them were committed." the oracles of God. All right, that's the role of the nation of Israel. Through the nation of Israel, not only came this book called the Bible with all of its prophetic statements, but through the nation of Israel came the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And that's what this prophecy <coughs> is talking about. And, and through Abraham, every nation on earth will be exposed to this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, because the nation, uh, the, uh, you know, nationally speaking, he was a Jew. Um, now, this prophecy, uh, there, there is another book on the planet. There, there is not another book on the planet that could even come close to our Bible. The Quran has no prophecy. The Book of Mormon has no prophecy. All these other religious books cannot do prophecy because when time passes, anything that they prophesy is not going to happen. And yet, you know, in our our Bible, we have over 300 distinct prophecies that were written hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. And on, upon Christ's first coming, there's over 300 of these prophecies which were fulfilled. Zechariah is one example. Zechariah chapter 9. Now, this is written some 500 years before it happened. Uh, and isn't, you know, and, and this isn't something that happens every day that someone would say, well, that's just a shot in the dark. This, this was a, a unique event. Uh, and this is just one of hundreds that were fulfilled to every last little detail. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, that's Jerusalem and the Jews. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king um, comes unto thee. He is just and having salvation, uh, lowly and riding on upon an ass or a donkey uh, and upon a colt of a foal of an ass. Well, you know, when did this happen? You look uh, in in the history of uh, of the Gospels and the triumphal en entry. Every last detail was fulfilled of Jesus riding uh, into Jerusalem off of the Mount of Olives across the Valley of Kindred, Kidron, sorry, and up to the Temple Mount on the colt of a donkey. And it was written 500 years before. King Cyrus and uh, the King of Persia was named by a Jewish prophet. Uh, 150 years before he was born. Uh, let's look at Psalm chapter 22 for an example, uh, written by King David. 
and uh, that's a thousand years before Christ's first uh, uh, first advent. Look at these descriptive words: Psalm twenty-two, verses seven and eight. All they, all they that see me laugh. Uh, sorry, all that they. Oh, I'll try it one more time. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. So who are they? Uh, who are we talking about? Isn't that exactly what they said to Jesus as, uh, as he was on his way to the cross? Um, well, if he if if he's who he says he was, let him call out ten thousand angels. This was all prophesied. This was this is is what would happen. So look look at Psalm twenty two verses nine and ten. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou did make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb, uh, though thou art my God and my mother's belly. Uh, what, what's David talking about? He's talking about the Messiah. Okay. I think what I'm going to do here uh, is I'm going to take this into the next study. Um, the only other thing I wanted to point out was uh, when um, what's interesting, just an interesting tidbit, uh, Abram, his name was changed to Abraham when God chose him. Uh, Sari was named to Sarah. Uh, and the, the, the common letter there is an H in English should be a He in Hebrew. He is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalit, He. He is the fifth letter. He has a value of five. But the, the letter He also has a value or a meaning, and that means grace. And so the reason why God changed their names and added a He or an H is because they were under God's grace. And so there's a lot of interesting value and meaning to the letters and to uh, uh, numerology in the, in, in the Jewish culture and the Jewish history uh, that can help you in understanding some of the scriptures. We're going to continue our study in the next uh, video. We'll pick up right here around uh, the Psalms again. Um, so I hope this has been helpful and informative. Thank you for viewing and good day.